the Memphis Grizzlies whooping tricks to the degree tricks have never been whooped. The Warriors mid trick whooping whilst being the tricks also whooping said tricks. And here's where, I mean, it just goes to the next level. Draymond Green talking, they're not gonna whoop that trick alone. We're gonna whoop the trick together if we're gonna whoop that trick. Unbelievable, let's go. That's a direct quote, I had to read it. I mean, I... Oh, my what God. Last night. So many. We'll get to, we'll get to that game. How the fuck do you know It's a statement and a question. The Giannis three, and then everything in the last 30 seconds. Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown losing the rebound. Drew Holiday devouring the Marcus Smart shot. And then Marcus Smart stripped again at midcourt by Holiday oh. to expire the time. What a thrilling win for Milwaukee. What a gut punch for Boston. Around the horn to Tim's Kalachaw. Did the Celtics give away game five? Or maybe the series? Or did Milwaukee take it? Oh, uh, Tony, I don't want to take anything away from Drew Holiday and those couple plays you just showed, but Incredible. I've got to put this on the Celtics. In a game five, you're playing at home. That's probably going to decide the series, a game you lead comfortably for much of the night. Uh, and even after getting a little wobbly in the fourth quarter, you have a six-point lead with two minutes to go. You should never lose that game if you're, if you're capable of being what you think you are. Now, beyond that, you saw the offensive rebounds there. The Bucks had 18 of them last night. Celtics couldn't keep him off the boards. And the bigger picture to me, Jason Tatum, this series is when he's supposed to be showing he can lead a team to do the same thing Giannis did last year, 39% from the field, 30% from three. Team didn't even take one in the fourth quarter. That's a collapse for me. Harry Lyles Jr., collapse for you. Tony, I can't help but feel like if the roles were reversed and we're talking about the other team in green and white and we're talking about the Celtics and we would be talking about a team that had a two-time MVP and Defensive Player of the Year coming off of a hard-earned championship that we would not be saying, did they earn that win? We would be saying, there's that championship pedigree. And I think that we should offer that same respect up to the Milwaukee Bucks because they did show that last night. Giannis had 40 and 11 points against a team that just held one of the greatest scores we've ever seen touch a basketball in check entire series. Mike Budenholzer saw, and I know it's crazy, L, we'll get to that in a second. He saw that they needed to adjust and switch on pick and rolls, a play in which they've been holding them to 0.68 points per possession on. And then you have Drew Holiday who wraps it up with a block and a steal in the final 10 seconds, the only time that's ever happened in the NBA postseason, mm. the Bucks earned that victory. L. Duncan. Yeah, I think it can be a little bit of both, right? Like, there's definitely been times where we've seen teams try to give the game away and the other team not take advantage of that. How many times have we watched a game and gone, does anyone want to win um, on the one hand? If you're the Celtics, if you're the Celtics fans, of course you feel like, you lost this one. Heading into last night, teams had lost 232 straight games when they were losing by six plus points with two minutes or less in the final frame of a playoff game. That was, of course, until last night. That screams choke job. But on the other side, like what Harry had just said, the fourth quarter was absolute brilliance for the Bucks. They were perfect from distance, six for six. They got eight of their 17 offensive rebounds in that final frame. That was good for nine second chance points. So they did exactly what we would expect this Bucks team to do. They stayed in there and won. I don't think this is as much about the Celtics as it is a team asserting themselves, a team that did the same exact thing last year. Ramona Shelburne. You know, I admire all the stats that my esteemed colleagues from Atlanta have brought out, right, in this mm -hmm. argument here. But sometimes it really does just come oh, down <laughs> to a couple of really important plays. And those defensive plays from Drew Holiday, I cannot stress how brilliant they were. The glove on Marcus Smart from behind, the presence of mind not to knock it out of bounds, but corral it himself, then to throw it off Marcus Smart where they get the possession back. Go back to the Bobby Portis follow on the missed free throw. Bobby Portis, my favorite, is Bobby Potis, who nicknamed himself that when he went to the to the White House. <laughs> um, like that play right there is amazing. And then Drew Holiday with the steal at the end. Those three plays right there won the game. And those are plays that people who have been to the championship, who won those 16 games in the in the playoffs, make. And that to me, it's all about the Bucks. Kalashaw back in. Well, I just think the championship pedigree that Harry mentioned is worth mentioning on the, on, the, on the Bucks side. They knew they didn't have Chris Middleton, who's either their second or third best player, depending on a given night. 
if you watch what he did in the conference finals in the finals last year, and they said to heck with it. We, we're going to beat this team anyway, and now they're going home up 3-2. And about halfway through the fourth quarter, you're looking at it and you're thinking they might be down 3-2 going home, and are, are they going to have to rush Middleton back? All that changes yep. with the way the game ends, and now Harry Lyle Jr., I'll ask you after the horn, are you calling it a wrap on this series? I think I will call it a wrap. I'm not, I'm not usually like to get ahead of myself here and do the Izzy Gutierrez, but yeah, series over. Duncan, you? <laughs> I'm going to call it a wrap. Just but listen, when Drew Holiday is saying that he's triggered because Marcus Smart was defensive player of the year, not him, good luck. <laughs> mm, Shelburne? No, I, I'm not going there yet. I, I still think Boston's really good, and th th they should be winning this series, right? Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. that Milwaukee yeah, has that so much too. guile that they've pulled these a couple of games out, and so I'm not going to call it yet. Dallas shot. I'm not going there yet, but I don't know why. You think that's going to get you points here on this show? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Tim. We'll move on. How the Grizzlies land basted the Warriors last night. That's a statement, but also a question. The game fives were a team with the chance to close it out. They don't normally look like this, right? It was 55 points. Golden State was trailing by 55 points in a game. Ostensibly, they thought they'd be clinching it. The Memphis Grizzlies did this without their MVP. They did this with malice in their heart. It was glorious. It was embarrassing. What was it, Ramona Shelburne? You know, the Warriors had 22 turnovers in this game. And you just showed a bunch of them, and they were all bad. Like, they weren't just like, oh, Memphis is forcing turnovers. There were 22 horrible turnovers. And you just, they, they call, it was a boat race, right? They, they, they've lapped them, and then at some point, Mike Brown just pulled the starters. I mean, I, I, I actually am less concerned about this for the Warriors and more impressed with what Memphis did. They, they, this is a team that 20 and 5 without John Morant in the regular season. They lost the four, last four, though, without him. And I think this was a game they had to they had to show some backbone. In this series, I've felt the Warriors have used the Grizzlies' aggression and emotion against them. They sort of baited them into mm -hmm. getting out of themselves. And, and in this one, they used that emotion for good. And, and so I thought not, that was really important for me. That it was 55 win. points at one time. That means nothing to you. 55! Nah, like, once, once you get boat race, you just pull your starters and call it a day. I read a Draymond Green quote before. I'm going to read another one uh, as we turn to you, Tim Kalashow. It's one game in the Laws column in a series. Don't make too much of it. Are you making anything of it? Yeah, I mean, when your starters are still playing and it's the third quarter and you're down by 44 points, and Ian Eagle <laughs> is saying, it's a 156 run by the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I think that shows there's a problem with this team. And now there's a silly... Uh, somewhat silly, but somewhat truthful uh, situation that the Warriors had. When you're playing in game five and you're up 3-1, but you're the road team, that's not as urgent as when you're the favorite and you're playing at home because you don't want to go fly to that other city yep. and extend the series. The Warriors don't care if they're going home to play game six. So I give them a small pass, but not much of a pass. Oh, because logistics and air travel, you're, you're saying you're going to go home anyway. So, okay. They're going Ramona, home anyway. Ramona's Might agreement. as well play some basketball when we get yeah. there. Harry Lyles Jr., to me, this just feels like the Warriors got caught sleepwalking a little bit. And usually we've seen over the years they've been the type of team where even if they fall down 15, 20, 25 points, we always expect the run to come and they're going to get back in the game. And it was shocking that it ended up getting to a point where they were not going to be able to do that. And this, no, this is no discredit to the Grizzlies because they are still a very good basketball team, even without John Moran. I think a lot of people were kind of sleeping on them, even though they are 21 and 6 without him is that Klay Thompson was a minus 45. Steph Curry played five minutes in the second half and had <laughs> zero points. Those are outliers. So I think that the Warriors will kind of take this game. They've got the vets and the experience. All right, so you, you're with Draymond Green them that it's one, bring it just forward. one loss. Sleepwalking a little bit, yeah. Harry said. What would be sleepwalking a lot then? Because they lost, we're down by 55 <laughs> at one point. If that's just a little sleepwalking. Yeah. L. Duncan, I turn to you. There are degrees of sleepwalking, walking into another room versus, like, getting in your car and driving. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, True. You know, watching the game yesterday, uh, Tony, uh, credit to Memphis because, you know, we keep talking about, well, they're 20-5 and five in the regular season without John Moran, but this is the postseason, and he's probably not coming back, and they know that that's, that's done. I imagine that after David Ruffin left the Temptations, 
the Temptations that were left in their very first concert were fantastic. But over time, you realized, yeah, it's not the same without David Ruffin. He's the soul of this team. Mm -hmm. For the Warriors, I wouldn't be worried at all. I'd be more worried. This is where I do disagree with Draybon. I'd be more worried if they do, did lose by five as opposed to losing by 40. Because if they had done the best they could and still got punched in the mouth by Memphis, that's a reason for concern. But there is nothing more symbolic than this Warriors team being completely unfazed by what happened than them dancing along to whoop that trick while the crowd was screaming it in their yeah, face. I want to talk about that. Care. We've seen teams in the past smile, laugh, goof off when they're losing. And we've heard from sports bloviators like you guys that that's upsetting to you. Last night they were down 46 when it happened, all right? <laughs> is it okay? I, I guess the first question is, is it okay? And I think you all would all agree. It's okay for the MC in the arena to, to whoop that trick in their face. And, but they did say Steph Curry, and they're baiting him like that. Is that okay? Is it okay for Draymond to dance, Harry Lyles Jr.? Yeah, 100%. I mean, like, look, if you're going to do that, it's absolutely fine. You better be able to back it up. And I think that we all agree that they're probably going to be the type of team to back it up. Kalisha? I think there are a lot of Warriors that are a little tired of Draymond Green making things about him. You saw Andre Iguodala grabbing at him the game he got kicked out of. Uh, I think it was game one. I, I don't think it serves any purpose. It's kind of silver. No, I think Draymond can do it, but if you had a rookie out there like uh, do that, it would be a, more of a concern. Jonathan Kaminga, don't do that. Draymond, you've got a couple of rings. Go ahead. L, I ain't too proud to beg for one last word from you. Go ahead. It's the bee rabbit approach to insults, right? You take all. But now they go home. They've already turned a, a should be the biggest goalie mismatch, a Vesna Trophy finalist against a third stringer. They've made that meaningless all series. I think the Penguins are still going to win. Harry Lyles Jr. Tony, I'm buying that the Penguins have history on their side. If Evgeny Malkin is going to perform the way that he has when Sidney Crosby has been out typically in 150 games, he has 77 goals, 125 assists, and 202 points. So historically, when he's been out, Malkin usually brings the heat, but that's going to be a, a different question come uh, the Stanley Cup if they're actually going to go the distance. Well, Duncan. I'm buying that uh, Sid the Kid's availability might not matter if they can get their all-star all goalie back. Uh, Tristan Jerry has been uh, skating. He's been practicing. It looks like maybe he'll be able to go uh, because while we love a good cult classic story about, you know, some wayward goalie who comes in with a belly full of pork in and, and ends up coming up clutch for his team, <laughs> uh, they have they really, really need Tristan Jerry back in net. Luis Domingue has given up 15 yeah. goals in his four starts. An alien coming down and watching this show for the first time all day. They have a lot of questions, yeah. but it's true. Yes, uh, uh, spicy pork and broccoli was in Domingue's belly when he got called into duty uh, in game one. Shelburne, now to you. Look, I, they have Jake Gensel. Seven goals, five playoff games, big game Jake. <laughs> I, they're going home to Pittsburgh. I, I think it's I think this is a, you can't, in hockey, home ice really matters, and we don't know what a team's about until they are faced with those mm. things. We'll move on. Watching Florida, Washington. It's been like pulling teeth for the President's Trophy winner to get wins in this series. And another early deficit. Panthers down 3 0. Who comes back from 3 0? Carter Vahegi does. A five point night. The comeback cats, they're calling him, Harry. What are you buying in this series now? I'm buying that this was a comeback the Panthers needed. I know it hasn't looked pretty throughout the series, but you're coming off the best regular season in your franchise's history. You've now got your first series lead in the postseason in a decade. This is where the Panthers need to be. I think they're going to get out of this series and hopefully get it together here and have a nice well run. Well, yeah, I'm buying that the Panthers did this. This is what they do. You sort of mentioned that. Uh, they've had six come from behind where they've been down for three goals, come from behind uh, games this season. That's the most since the 83-84 Oilers. Mm. Of course, the Gretzky Oilers who ended up winning the Stanley Cup. So I think it's fantastic. But I will say this. We talked about did the Celtics blow it earlier? The Caps absolutely blew it. They haven't given up a three-goal lead in 40 years. Unreal. Mm -hmm. Ramona Shelburne. Well, this cast team has a lot of the same players from when they won the Stanley Cup. And I, when, I, when I have veteran teams, I don't count them out. Plus, when they won the Stanley Cup, they actually came back from down 2-0 in a series in the first round and down 3-2 in the conference final. So I, let, let's give them some room. Mm -hmm. Tim Kalisha. The last time Florida won a playoff series, John Van Beesbrook was in Nets. It's probably time to move on from the that. The Beezer. Oh, I haven't heard that name in a and, while. And, you know, when you look at the fact that Florida still hasn't scored a power play goal in this series, one of the best scoring teams in the league. And Washington has survived all that. I don't think they can Curse of the anymore. President's Trophy winner, Kalisha. You believe it's applying here, or is it the curse of the Beezer? 
It's been a while since he rolled the earth. <laughs> yeah. We'll move on. WNBA week one. The games have been great. How about the dream start, Al? It's, it's, it's all been a dream. But a story we've done before, rearing its head again, commercial flights. Brianna Stewart, her tweets at the storm's unavailability list for COVID protocol. She says, fly commercial, they say. And Natasha Cloud, she missed the Mystics game two days ago for COVID protocol. She's also blamed flying commercial during a pandemic. And then this. General manager of the Las Vegas Aces tweeting and then deleting, it took 12 hours to fly from Las Vegas to Washington for the game. She tagged famous rich people for donations to get the league to fly charter. That's Natalie Williams, a basketball Hall of Famer, an all-time great, hashtagging Oprah and Elon Musk and LeBron saying, send money. Well, there's the commercial flight debate and the COVID risk, but how does a league GM tagging rich people to ask for donations come off the field? Yeah, I'm, I'm typically not in the business of criticizing when I don't have a better solution. And um, I understand that the women of this league are fiercely protective of this league and of these women. They understand the inequities. Uh, but it's the it's the word donate, right? Like when you take such issue with the idea that people think that you're a cause anyway or a laundromat for the NBA's money, uh, to say donate as if it's a charitable cause is, is where I have the biggest concern. Maybe asking to partner up, maybe using some of those, um, you know, channels in the background to reach out to these kinds of people. But it just feels, I get it though like what are you supposed to do these women just had they have no options um and so you it results to you know begging people on twitter it's really sad that it's come to this ramona shelver here's a word invest right yeah. who wants to invest in this um because i think there's a there's a business aspect to this that's hard to overlook right if you own a WNBA franchise you, you probably are very interested in the league you you you're invested in the yeah. league you're willing to take sometimes multi-million dollar losses because a lot of the franchises do lose money still but Kathy Engelbert's big mission that she's had since she's taken over as commissioner has been to build the business of the WNBA I think they're working on it um, but use a different word Tim Callister. I think they were working on building that business when they collectively bargained all this in 2020. Yeah. Then a pandemic came, and the idea of new sponsorships and new revenues, that all ex went, went away. So I, I think it's a very difficult time uh, for the league. To be, uh, the, somebody should do it. Somebody can do it for them. But it's understandable why it hasn't happened Aaron yet. Studio. You know, so to Elle's point, we're, we're kind of in this position because we've always treated women and women's sports as something less. I think right now, obviously, financially, this is difficult for the WNBA. From a player's safety perspective with COVID, that's an issue. Even without COVID, it's an issue because Kelsey Plum has mentioned flying commercial is difficult when I don't have a night off to get full rest, and then it affects the product on the court. To me, if you're Kathy Engelbert in the WNBA, you should view this and as a initiative. Five at home, L. Duncan. And that depends, you know. Are we going to see the Sixers team that we saw for 22 seconds in Game 5, the one that stormed out to a 2-0 lead, or not? Um, honestly, I'm going to go with the Suns because Monty Williams is 4-0 on the road in closeout games. with. So nobody's got a chance at survival. No, I, th I think Dallas has the better chance to win tonight. Uh, Philadelphia, we're still wondering about exactly what happened to Embiid. Is he 100%? Dallas doesn't have an injury problem. They had a turnover problem in the third quarter the other night. They need to do something about that. But they, they won the two games. Like Dallas is about to have a turnover problem this showdown. We'll move on. What? Striking out in a ball that hits you. Oh, man, look at this. I mean, you know the exact moment. Francisco Mia right here knew he was going to hit him. And it happened again. It happened twice in baseball yesterday. Jorge Alfaro did it as well. Tim Kalisha, uh, make a ruling here on this. What's amazing is these guys are, are catchers. They should know kind of where the ball is going. But as a lad who had some strikeout issues himself, I feel like if the ball hits you, that's a that's a base. It doesn't matter if you're swing. That's that's. Oh, that's a mute. The right most here. interesting part of all of this to me is that if they had not swung at either one of those pitches, Angel Hernandez would have called it a strike. All right, you got jokes. It doesn't matter. Kalishaw might have been swinging mm. and getting hit by a pitch in this one. FaceTime. Hell done. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so by now you probably heard the story about uh, one of the last remaining surviving Tuskegee Airmen, retired Sergeant Victor W. Butler, who lives in Rhode Island. He's turning 100 on May 21st. 
And so his family has been asking the public to send letters, and I sent one. My grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman. He died about nine years before I was born. I never had a chance to talk to him, so I just talked to a man that I don't know about him, and I would encourage you to do that. Give that man his flowers while he's still here to read them. Certainly a group of men that deserve it more than anyone. That is